Thanks. So I'm going to be talking about my favorite topic, which is all the cool things we could do with INSA related to geohazards. So this is basically going back to one of the original questions of UNAFCO, which was, can we use geodesy to decrease the loss of life associated with hazards? And can we use it for societal benefits? So moving from the nature cover of the Landers earthquake, we've been looking at a lot of co-seismic deformation. This is just a small subset, but we are learning about the sources of these events and where the faults are and basically mapping the deformation. We can also look at the damage proxy map much faster. This is done from the area group where they got a Christchurch damage map in three days instead of eight months by looking at loss of coherence. So very exciting application for what happened after earthquake, but ultimately we would want to use geodesy to what we can do before the hazards actually happen. So can we have uh, better understanding of where the earthquake could be, how big they could be? Can we predict or forecast volcanic eruption and so on with geodesy? So this is an example of UNAFCO's own Scott Baker's work, looking at how the formation temporarily and spatially varies at Kilauea volcanoes and how the deformation can be related to volcanic activity to better understand how volcanoes uh, basically behave. Looking at a larger scale, this is the entire volcanic arc of Sumatra trying to identify if we see systematic deformation before eruption, in which case we do and in which case we don't, to see what, deformation, what the role of deformation can be in uh, predicting eruption. Looking at interseismic deformation, we can use INSA alone without GPS to get at the deep slip on the fault and the shallow slip needed to creep. And from this map, we can also do a gradient map of this shallow slip due to grip to map a fault from space. And this is basically very important because we're going to get at a better constraint, especially of where our faults are linked. And this is the case of the Hayward Calaveras fault where we found a junction, meaning that we can have a larger earthquake on this structure. Moving to hydrology, we can look at everywhere where we have subsidence. And in Indonesia, it's basically everywhere. So we can look at how fast and exactly what controls the rate of subsidence. But it has also major implication because we can map what is going to happen to these Indonesian cities given how fast they subside. And for Jakarta, we're going to be facing very large problem in the very near future due to this very fast subsidence. When we look at hydrology in other places, we can find also a lot of other signal. This is the example of Mexico, where again we find subsidence due to groundwater pumping almost everywhere. And this, is, uh, due, this can be due with INSAR because we have a lot of spatial coverage. Basically, we can look anywhere. What we learn in Mexico is that we can also use the hydrological deformation to map faults because the faults control the partitioning of the hydrological deformation. And your eye gradients can result in very, uh, damage, in very large damage in the area. You can also learn more about your faults by modeling your hydrological deformation. By trying to reproduce the partitioning, you can learn the properties that you need to have on your fault and the age of activity, how shallow your faults need to come in the sediment section. So we can also look at completely different applications. And if we have, for example, wealth data and um, deformation data, we can calibrate our deformation data. And then without wealth data, we can predict what is the level of water in wells from just INSAR, which is pretty exciting for uh, water resources. These are some examples of looking at landslide with INSAR from the Berkeley group with the slow-moving landslide in Berkeley and also the, the fast-moving Mongolian landslide which, uh, where we can extract different components of the velocity from the UAV SAR. We can also deal with illegal activity. Uh, this is an example of work I recently did looking at black sand mining activities in the Philippines using both INSAR and um, optical images to identify both where it's happening and what are the environmental impacts. We can also map how fast ice sheets are moving. This is an example of Antarctica, but a lot of work is also done on glaciers in uh, Chile, for example, to try to better understand how our climate is changing and uh, INSAR can be used for that. We can also map with very high resolution the subsidence due to peat oxidation following deforestation. And because it's INSAR, we can do it at the scale of an entire continent. So we can start mapping all the subsidence due to deforestation and as just Brendan mentioned, we can get at CO2 estimates. So we can turn our subsidence map into emission of CO2 at very global scale following deforestation of this peatland forest. So this is pretty cool, and INSAR is really an exciting technique, and it has a very bright future. We have uh, Sentinel-1A, Future-1B, we have ELOS-2, and we're going to have NISAR. So the secret to get more application is to keep the free access to data, the well-archived data like WinSAR is doing, 
And we are probably going to be able to do a lot more with INSAR. Thank you.